Our next speaker is Melinda Tankard Reist. Uh, Melinda is a Canberra author, speaker, commentator, and advocate with a special interest in issues affecting women and girls. She has authored three books Giving Sorrow Words, Women's Stories of Grief After Abortion, Defiant Birth, Women Who Resist Medical Eugenics, which she will talk about those two issues uh, this afternoon, and Getting Real, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls, which was released just last year, end of last year, already in its second printing, and you can buy it here. Third printing, and you can buy it here. Melinda has just initiated a new grassroots campaign movement, Collective Shout, to expose corporations, advertisers, and marketers who objectify women and sexualize girls to sell products and services. Uh, in demand as a speaker, Melinda is named in the who's who of Australian women and the world who's who of women. She's married with four children. You may have seen her quoted in the New Zealand Herald on Monday about the sexualization of children, and then lo and behold, Tuesday morning, she's on the front page of the New Zealand Herald commenting on Pam Corkery's brothel for women. So uh, she's made waves uh, even in the short time that we promoted her coming to the country. And Melinda, we want to give you a, a big Kiwi welcome. Let's welcome Melinda Tankard Reist. Thanks very much for that warm welcome, Bob. And I must admit that that joke wasn't too bad. I was expecting much worse. So that was a relief. Look, thanks very much for having me here today. And I appreciate your interest in your concern about these issues. I want to talk to you today about the way the proliferation and globalization of sexual imagery is overlapping with childhood, shaping an environment in which our children are increasingly seen as valid participants in a public culture of sex. Girls and boys are growing up in a shadow cast by pornography. Pornography's value systems and its scripts have become mainstreamed. Adult sexual concepts are seeping into girl and boy world at a time when they're not developmentally or cognitively equipped to fully understand or comprehend those kind of messages. Now, I want to say at the outset a couple of things. One is, this is a fairly um, graphic uh, presentation. I used to edit it for nice people like yourselves. I used to cut out some of the bad stuff. I actually don't do that anymore because I feel like we need to wake up. We need to wake up and smell the manure, not the roses because things are really, really bad. So I'm going to be showing you some graphic material, but I want to say this. This material I'm showing you is all from mainstream popular culture. I haven't gone to the back blocks of Canberra's sex industry. I live in Canberra. We are the, the national porn capital. I haven't gone to the back blocks of that industry to find you this material. This is from billboards, toys, games, music video clips targeted at children. So it's all mainstream. The other thing I want to say to you is don't get mad with me. Some people get offended with me. Like, I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't put the sexual slogans on the kids' clothes. I didn't put the naked women on the billboards. So if you could refrain from throwing anything at me, I'd be very grateful. If you need to close your eyes or leave, I won't be offended at all, and I will warn you um, with some of the, some of the imagery. I'll, I'll give you a warning. But as I said, mainstream, 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 uh, and this is what... This is the culture in which our children are growing up. This is the wallpaper against which we are trying to raise happy, healthy, resilient children and finding it very difficult because the culture is undermining us at every level, at every turn. The other thing is I may get a little bit passionate. Uh, I have four children. I have three teenagers. I have three girls in those four children. And uh, I take this stuff personally. I'm not just coming to you today as a, a, a writer, a researcher in the field. Uh, I can see the way that this culture is targeting my children. So I do get a little bit passionate. And sometimes in my darker moments, I think that perhaps arranged marriage isn't such a bad idea. And perhaps you've got some nice sons and we can talk later and not tell the kids and get something sorted out. And uh, I only say that partly jokingly because I lament at the kind of boys that we're raising and whether there will be suitable partners for my, my daughters because I think what we're doing to boys is, is equally destructive and diabolical. They are getting distorted ideas about girls and women and what girls and women are good for. So what I'm going to do is take you on a, a cultural tour and I'm going to show you many of the images that our children are being exposed to. And I'm not just targeting one particular image, it's the cumulative total, the cumulative impact of all of these messages. 
So thanks to the pornification of culture, many girls have come to think that their bodies and their sexual allure are all they ha have to offer the world. So not their talents or their abilities or their creativity or their spirituality or their desire to make a difference in the world. It's all about being thin, hot and sexy. So many girls are aspiring to this stereotype normative view of what it is to be a woman today. Stereotype makeover, another J-Lo, Beyonce, Britney combo to go. Now this isn't totally far-fetched. A 2006 survey of 1,015 to 19 year old girls in the UK found that 63% said their ideal profession was to be a glamour model posing nude or semi-nude. That's what they wanted to be when they grow up. Do we have any nurses or teachers in the room? Put your hand up if you're a nurse or a teacher. You were last on the list. They don't want to be nurses or teachers. I hate to tell you that. I hate to break that to you. That's not what they're wanting to be. So raised in this pornographic media landscape, girls are expected to possess a sexual knowingness, reduced to thinking that their role is as sexual service stations for boys. Younger and younger girls are being pressured to adopt pornified roles and behaviours. And even the bodies of younger and younger girls are being repackaged as sexually interesting, even sexually available. And all this contributes to a distorted and delusional set of myths about girls currently circulating in our culture. The psychologist Mary Pfeiffer says, girls are having more trouble now than they had 30 years ago. They are much more oppressed. They're coming of age in a more dangerous, sexualized and media saturated culture. As they navigate a more dangerous world, girls are less protected. So we've taken away the boundaries that once protected our girls. And I argue that women and girls are more oppressed today than, than ever. The psychologist Steve Bidolf, who many of you would have heard of, he has a beautiful chapter in my book called The Trashing of Girlhood. And he says, in a piecemeal and cumulative way, these messages are invading and tarnishing girls' visions of themselves, making it impossible to put together a positive and integrated view of self. Now, the American Psychological Association did a very important study, its task force on the sexualization of girls. And uh, there's been a couple of significant studies since then, the UK Home Office report, a report out of Scotland, all coming to the same conclusions that the pornification of culture is having harmful effects on our, on our girls and our young women in particular. And the APA said a culture can be infused with sexualised representations of women and girls, suggesting that such sexualisation is good and normal. There is evidence that sexualization contributes to impaired cognitive performance in college-age women. And related research suggests viewing material that is sexually objectifying contributes to body dissatisfaction, eating disorders, low self-esteem, depressive effect, and even physical health problems in high school-aged girls and in young women. So our young women don't like themselves very much. It's been said that self-hatred is a rite of passage for our teenage girls today. In addition to leading to feelings of shame and anxiety, sexualizing treatment and self-objectification generates feelings of disgust towards one's physical self. Girls may feel they are ugly or gross or untouchable. These are stats from Australia, but I'm sure that you have corresponding stats here in New Zealand. A Mission Australia survey of 20,000 young people, 29,000 young people, 11 to 24, found body image was the number one issue for them, ahead of family conflict, stress, bullying, alcohol, drugs and suicide. These findings have been consistent for the last four years. The last four years, this, this study has found the same result. One in 100 adolescent girls in Australia is anorexic, one in five bulimic, so they're eating and deliberately purge, purging, binging, throwing up. Close to 20% are using fasting for two or more days to lose weight. Another 13% use vomiting. Others rely on slimming pills, chewing but not swallowing food, smoking and laxative abuse. And my mate Sandra Patterson has just handed me this from your New Zealand Herald today. Here's an ad for pretzels. You can never be too thin. You can never be too thin. Well, yes, you can and you might die because anorexia kills most of the girls who have that condition. And if it doesn't kill them, it le leaves them with long-lasting physical health problems. So that is a dangerous ad saying you can never be too thin. And that's just a classic example of the messaging our girls get about their bodies. They're aspiring to impossible to attain airbrushed, hypersexualized images of women, and they can't look like that. In fact, most celebrities and models don't look like that either. Um, I interviewed a model once, and she said she didn't recognize herself in the pages of the magazine because of the amount of digital enhancement and airbrushing and 
hair and makeup and styling that goes into these kind of images. One in four teenage girls in Australia wants to have plastic surgery. Isn't this a sign of how much they hate themselves? And self-harm is the highest cause of hospital admission for girls in Australia between 13 and 19, deliberately harming their own bodies. Here we get to our cultural tour now. This is a line of clothing designed by Beyonce Knowles' mother. If you haven't heard of Beyonce Knowles, uh, I'd like to know where you live and I'll come and live there with you. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> this is Beyonce Knowles' mother. She's designed this clothing for little girls, which I've dubbed little hoe wear. Um, in the front there, you can see the five-inch stiletto heels. Talking about healthy child development, how is a little girl supposed to run and, and play uh, wearing those kind of shoes, which are developmentally bad for her feet? Here we have high heel shoes for babies. I'm not making this up. These have recently been imported into Australia. So we're seeing these adult, this adultifying of our, of our children, making them grow up fast. Child development experts are saying that we are losing the age, which was known as middle childhood. The ages between 9 and 13 are being disappeared because we are catapulting them into the, the teenage years. Here we have makeovers for babies and toddlers. So it's not just adult women that are subjected to this. Enhancements include mouth replaced, doll eyes added, cheekbones defined, brow shaped, skin tanned and powder and lipstick added. Why would you do that? Here we have Miley Cyrus's little sister. Anyone here who hasn't heard of Miley Cyrus, I'll come and live at your place as well. Um, I've had audiences that haven't heard of Miley, Miley Cyrus. This is her little sister Noah. Noah is nine. Noah and her best friend there, they're on their way to a party. Noah has just launched a lingerie range for nine-year-old girls and upwards. She herself is nine. Here we have an image from Vogue Bambini. Again, you see the way that girls, young girls, are stylized in adult women's ways, suggesting they are much older than they are with the natural dangers that go with that adultification of children. Gone are the days of voluminous, bulky and cumbersome underwear. These days, underwear has become briefer, bolder, and more stylish. There is even underwear to complement different moods you wish to portray, frisky, seductive, or mysteriously alluring. That is a description of the latest trends in little girls' underwear. Frisky, seductive, or mysteriously alluring. People send me things from all over the country. I have the most disgusting stash of things in my home. If the child welfare people came and visited, I'd probably be arrested. These are underwear sent to me from Tasmania for Christmas for children. Try jingling these, stop staring at my bobs and unwrap me. Why would you think that was appropriate? There's no laws to stop any of this, by the way. Why is this appropriate underwear for our children? Who needs credit cards? Mainstream department store. Girls, you don't need credit cards. You can get cold hard cash by selling your bodies. You are only the value of your breasts and your genitals, essentially, and you can use that to get ahead in life. Who needs credit cards? So we're training girls in prostitute-like behaviours. Cotton on for kids, mainstream company, cotton on for kids, I'm a tits man on the toddler jumpsuit for little boys, bringing sexy back and I'm living proof my mum is easy. Now we've had a campaign against this and as we speak cotton on is withdrawing thousands of these jumpsuits, which is good news, of course it's good news and we can celebrate that, but why should we have to have these campaigns in the first place? Who is it sitting around the corporate table thinking up these slogans? That's what I want to know. Who are these people that think that's a good idea to put on a toddler jumpsuit? Here we have some other t-shirts for toddlers and babies. The top one in the red, again, family shopping malls. Family shopping malls. I've seen these t-shirts, they're tiny. They're baby size. Okay? I'm not making this stuff up. Porn star t-shirts, these are so ubiquitous you probably don't notice them anymore. The one down the bottom left, which you probably can't read, is an Abercrombie and Finch t-shirt that says, who needs a brain when you have these? Of course, the slogan is across the girl's chest. Girls, you don't need to think. You don't need to use your brains at all because you have breasts and that's really all you need to get ahead in life. Make me hot, Mr. Sexpot. This is in our girlfriend magazine in Australia. Um, again, Sexualizing girls. Girlfriend magazine being read by 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girls. These are a range of t shirts bought, bought to you by our most popular tween store. Do you have Supre here? You do have Supre here. Okay, you will not be shopping at Supre anymore, and your children, you must talk to your daughters about this. Here's three t shirts bought to you by Supre Santa's bitch for Christmas. So this suggests to girls that she is owned by Santa, so she's, he's the pimp, 
She's owned by him and she's at his beck and call. Tween age we're talking about here. This one from Supre. Now most little girls wouldn't have a clue what this means. They see the kitten, they think isn't that cute. I argue Supre is putting girls in danger, corporate social irresponsibility. And here's the third one just out from Supre. If you don't understand what this means, and I'm sorry to get a bit direct here with you, High beams refers to erect nipples, girls in a state of sexual excitement. We're talking tween age girls here, and Supre seems to think this is appropriate for our little girls to wear. So we hate Supre, we are running campaigns against Supre, we are boycotting Supre, and I hope you will do the same thing here, because I bet you these t-shirts are here as well. This is probably the worst I've seen. Flat-chested girl, work in progress, down the bottom, she's good to go. Again, who is thinking this is okay? And how much worse will it get if we don't take action? Tweenage push-up bra, brought to you by Best and Less. Do you have Best and Less here in New Zealand? Okay. Best and Less is a mainstream family department store. And uh, they produce this bra for girls aged 6 to 12. Creating the illusion of breasts in girls that don't have any. Why would you want to do that exactly? So I was blogging on this in my home office. Outrage, 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 Best and Less, Tweenage push-up bra. And within 24 hours, this was removed from every store in the country. Again, that's great news, but who thought this was okay in the first place? We're seeing sexualized scripts being played out by our very popular celebrities, our pop stars that our girls are looking up to. Uh, this is Nikki Webster, who was our Olympics sort of queen, our Olympics girl, and uh, she's now doing naked photo shoots for Semi Naked for Ralph and Zoo, our lads' magazines. Gabriella Chilmy um, was popular and she could actually sing, so this is particularly sad because she actually had some natural talent. Uh, and now she's doing sexualized music video clips. Ricky Lee Coulter, uh, who started out on Australian Idol, and now she's showing she's a real woman because she's doing shoots for Ralph. There's this script that when they hit a certain age, then they have to start producing uh, sexualized video clips and acting in sexualized ways. Lindsay Lohan, again, you can see the progression from Disney Star. I'll get on to Lindsay a little bit more later. And Miley Cyrus, who's uh, loved by little girls everywhere, and now she's um, cavorting around doing simulated sex acts in her latest video clips, uh, because that's what you do when you hit 16 or 17 and prove that you're a woman. Here we have mobile phone wallpaper for our little girls in uh, Dolly and Girlfriend. Sex, when it's good, it's really good. When it's bad, it's still good. That's the message about sexuality that our girls get from reading Dolly and Girlfriend. Dolly is even younger readers than Girlfriend. Do you have Dolly here in New Zealand? Okay, so we know that actually bad sex is just bad sex, and a lot of girls regret their first sexual experience, which was characterised by drunkenness and force. Research out of Western Australia two years ago, most girls, a majority of girls, regret their first sexual experience. Bad sex is bad sex, and uh, our little girls need to be given a better message about sexuality than that. Here you see how insidious these mobile phone wallpapers are. You have the sexy hunks in the advertising, and then you have the kittens and the puppies and the snoopies. It's all mixed in together. Down the bottom here, you have D&G, drunk and gorgeous. There's nothing gorgeous about being drunk. If you've seen girls drunk and throwing up into the gutter and being sexually violated, uh, there's nothing gorgeous at all about it. And there's some of the images of what happens to girls as a result of binge drinking and drink spiking. So why would a magazine loved, very popular with girls, tell them it's gorgeous to be drunk? It's not gorgeous. And uh, they can end up being assaulted and harmed in so many ways. Here we have another example from Girlfriend magazine. They did a special on lads mags, why boys like to read lads mags. And in the same issue, you have Chuppa Chups and Minnie Mouse, mixing it all up, making it all seem sweet and cute. Girlfriend magazine had a Playboy t-shirt giveaway. They said to girls, if you want to be cool, you must wear the Playboy brand. A lot of girls have no idea about Playboy. They have no idea about Hugh Hefner, the man responsible for the trivialization of female sexuality on a global scale. Playboy has been very clever. You have to realize it's not just about the men's magazine anymore. Playboy has its logo on everything. Uh, they have their logo on Duna covers for girls, pillow slips, pencil cases, and here we have Playboy makeup. That includes Tie Me to the Bed Post Blush, so you have a sadomasochistic representation there for the girls' makeup, and Hef's favorite lip gloss. 
Now, I argue that Heff's favourite lip gloss should be called Disgusting Old Man in Silk Pyjamas Lip Gloss because he's 83 years old. Girls are wearing the brands of the global sex industry and they think it's about cute bunnies. When you ask them why they wear Playboy, they say, oh, it's the rabbit, it's so cute. So I say, well, look, here's Hugh Hefner. Let's educate you about this man. And there he is kissing Keisha and there he is again. And when I go into schools, I like to go back and forth on these images a few times and have them begging me to stop and promising they'll never wear Playboy again. And then I know my job is done and I can move on to the next school because there he is. That is Mr Playboy right there, girls. That is who you are making money for by wearing the Playboy brand. Here we have the pole dancing kit for children sold through a British toys and games company teaching girls how to pole dance. It includes a sexy garter belt and a DVD demonstrating suggestive dance moves for our little girls to practice. And it says you can earn a fortune in peekaboo dance dollars by doing these dances for your family and your friends. Training girls in this kind of behaviour as Melissa Farley, the anti-trafficking authority in the US says in my book Getting Real, trained by Western culture, girls learn to present a hypersexualized prostitute-like version of themselves to the world. Here we have Bratz dolls. The manufacturer of Bratz says these baby Bratz, that's the little ones to your right, really know how to flaunt it and they're keeping it real in the crib. What are they flaunting exactly? Here we have the Miss Bimbo game being played online by little girls. The aim of this game is to become the world's hottest bimbo. How do you do that? You have breast implants, you pick up boys in the bimbo club and of course you lose weight. This is a new game being played by little girls called My Minx. In this game the girl adopts a second life and avatar personality who is in this case a prostitute. She can live the life of a prostitute in this game for little girls. Now this is not your average, but she's very responsible, this prostitute. She buys the morning after pill every day and she adopts third world children. So she's a humanitarian. We're teaching our children how to be humanitarians. You see, how to care for the dispossessed, unwanted children of the world. Our Australia Institute uh, did an, an, an analysis of little girls magazines, Barbie, Total Girl, Disney, and found that three quarters of the content was sexualizing material. There's some of those magazines there and you probably have the same or the equivalent here. I want to say something now about billboards. Why is it that if a man were to put up a naked pinup of a woman in his office, that's illegal. I hope it's illegal here. It's illegal in Australia. It's called sexual harassment. You can't do it. But our marketers and our advertisers can put up giant billboards all over the public domain where we have no choice but to look at them and that's meant to be funny and clever and, and uh, free speech. So Lauren Rosewarne also in my book makes a really good point about the double standards there and how we're normalising pornographic imagery by allowing these kind of billboards. Here's some advertising that our Advertising Standards Board has said is not sexualised in Australia. They said that's not sexualised because there's no nipples or genitals showing. That's an ad for Lee Jeans. Now I've got some amazing news about this one. We've been campaigning against this for five years. This is on a bus, it's advertising a gentleman's club, I use that term very loosely. And uh, this is on a main school run in Melbourne and just last night, we, we won this just last night. This bus has been moved, it's been parked somewhere else. So that's a win as well. But five years ago, our Advertising Standards Board said this was not a sexual image. And we've just kept pushing and pushing it, and five years later we've won. But they haven't admitted that they were wrong five years ago, that we've had to put up with this for so long. Uh, but that is another victory for Collective Shout. Here's another ad. These are all from Melbourne. This one is very popular, what longer lasting sex. Do you have the Advanced Medical Institute here in New Zealand? So you got rid of it. Well, that's good news too. So they've, we, they've had a lot of complaints, so they changed it to the very poetic and charming Bonk Longer. This is another one of theirs for a star performance. You see that girl looks about 14 or 15 years old. Drinks Bright looks sexy, so even the children's drink has sexual references and connotations that go with it. This is an ad for a brothel in Melbourne. Sex, chocolate and flowers not required. So boys, you don't need to romance girls. You don't need to develop true connection and real intimacy with girls or women. You can just buy them, just buy them for sex. This is another ad for diesel jeans. That one's not very nice, is it? That's for perfume, in case you're wondering. Here we have, again, pornographic imagery being used in mainstream advertising. And if you don't understand the representations here, I'm actually not going to explain them to you. This is for a hamburger company. 
This is for Clinique. This is a classic pornographic imagery here, but as I said, I won't explain it if you don't understand it. Here we see the uh, positioning of porn magazines in with the kids' magazines. So in the middle there, you've got uh, Asian Anal Special, and to the left you have Scooby-Doo. All in together, acclimatising our children to pornography, often at children's eye level, certainly in Australia, I would suspect here as well. You'll often notice the pornography is beside the lollies. Uh, in the milk bars, the 7-Elevens and the petrol stations. Here's another example. I'm sorry this is a bit harder to read, but when me and my friends go into these stores with our cameras and start photographing the pornography, it's kind of a bit hard to explain, so we do it really quickly and then get out. So here we have the lads mags, Ralph and uh, Zoo. In with, down the bottom, Dora the Explorer colouring books. All in together, Dora the Explorer, in with the lads mags. And of course, girls go to the, or boys go to the milk bar for an ice cream after school, and that's the message they get about girls and women that they are made for sex. That's all women and girls are good for. Here's some worse examples. In these examples, this is illegal pornography, thousands of titles we've discovered in our milk bars, 7 Elevens, and petrol stations promoting sex with underage girls, rape, and incest themes. How do I know that? Because I've read it. I don't talk about stuff I haven't read, and of course, there's a price to be paid for that. So we sent these magazines to the heads of BP, Shell and Mobile. Here's another example. I'm ready for my first time. I've doctored that image. Heads of Mobile, Shell and BP and said, is this consistent with your corporate branding? They said, no, it's not. And they've removed them from all of their petrol stations, but they are still in many more petrol stations. So you need to complain about this stuff. Have a look. Have a look at what's out there and uh, get your regulatory bodies onto it. We're seeing again how pornographic scripts are being played out by boys. These are some recent headlines in Australia. Schoolboys accused of raping girl eight. 35 charged with possessing child porn. One was 12 years old. Boys who see porn are more likely to harass girls. Teenagers charged with raping boys. And just before I came here, we had front page story in The Australian about the rise of child on child sexual assault. More and more children assaulting other children. Is that because little boys are naturally bad? No, I don't believe that at all. It's because they're learning how to treat girls from the influence of pornography, particularly internet pornography. We know that 70% of boys have seen pornography by the age of 12, 100% by the age of 15. They are being socialised to treat women and girls as sexual objects, only there for their sexual gratification and pleasure. We're seeing a rise of violent crimes being committed by younger boys against younger girls. I work quite a bit with sexual assault counsellors. They tell me the latest things they are seeing is 12 and 13 year old girls who have been anally raped by groups of boys. That's the latest trend. They said five years ago they weren't seeing that, now they are. Why? We have to ask why. Again, the influence of pornography. I'm going to lighten the mood now and talk about cosmetic surgery. What we're seeing is a rise of cosmetic surgery procedures which originated in the sex industry and in, in Hollywood. More and more girls are seeking to have breast implants. They hate their natural bodies. Even teenage girls are desiring to have breast implants. More and more girls are undergoing Brazilian waxing. Again, they're ashamed of their natural body. They think their natural body is to be despised. There was a documentary shown in the UK where boys from a high school were shown 10 pairs of breasts, normal breasts and enhanced breasts. They hated the normal breast. They groaned, they despised it because they're only seeing the enhanced version because of pornography. They don't know what a natural woman's body looks like. When they were shown women that still had pubic hair, there is an audible gasp. These boys audibly gasp in shock because again, they don't see that. This is the Convince Her to Get Bigger Breasts manual designed for men. All the psychological tricks that men can use to get their girlfriend or wife to go up a few cup sizes because that's, what, that's what's valued. So girls, again, think they are inferior. They get the message over and over again, they can never be good enough. This is a book designed by a cosmetic surgeon, surprise, surprise, to explain to children why mummy has had a breast implant, a tummy tuck, and a nose job, my beautiful mummy. Again, socialising children to want to have cosmetic surgery, because you see here the swirls, the sparkles, the butterflies. She's been touched by the fairy godmother, so that little girl will probably want the same thing. You can have a laugh at this point because you need it, I can tell. The many faces of the Botox babe. <laughs> I can always tell you when, when you get to the asleep part because there's a rise in the, in the laughter. I want to say something now about the mainstreaming of violence and presenting violence as something that is sexy. Violence and sex are going together 
in music video clips where the message is that women are insatiable, that they want to be treated violently, they want to be abused, they want rough to be treated roughly, they want to be hit and beaten around. I'll just give you an, a recent example. Rihanna has produced a, a song with Eminem, who you've probably heard of, and it says, I love the way it hurts. I love the way it hurts. She's glamorising violence, glamorising being hit and beaten. This is from America's Next Top Model crime scenes victims episode where the model had to make out that she'd been murdered and the woman that looked the sexiest dead is the one that won this particular episode. This was being shown on a Sunday night at 6.30 before Australian Idol. So this one's been poisoned, drowned, electrocuted, pushed off a rooftop, stabbed, 6.30 on a Sunday night for our little girls to get the message that it's cool to be treated violently. Organs stolen, note the kidney dish in the front. Pushed downstairs, shot, decapitated. This is an ad for a shoe shop in Melbourne showing a woman trussed up in the back of a car. This has been dubbed terror pornography. This is from Vogue. And again, you see the violent images there, the dog, the baton, the, neck to the, the boot to the woman's neck. This is um, a simulated gang rape scene for Dolce & Gabbana. Here we have, great hair never dies. So if you're going to die, if you're going to be killed, make sure your hair looks good. Here we have Lindsay Lowen's latest photo shoot, dripping with blood, self-harm marks all over her arm, gun to her mouth. Lindsay Lowen, one of our celebrities again that our girls are looking up to, glamorising, glorifying blood and violence. Here we have a range of t-shirts that were sold by our standard menswear store in Australia, Roger David, uh, women gagged, bound, blindfolded in our men's stores. I Like My Women Imported is a t-shirt found in Sydney, pro-trafficking message right there. These are some of the worst I've seen. It's not rape, it's surprise sex. So we are redefining rape as surprise sex. What does that tell rape victims? That they should have just enjoyed it. This is another one. It's not rape if you yell surprise. A boy wrote into an internet site and said, is it really true that if I yell surprise then I won't be charged with rape? Uh, no, it's not. This is a game called Rape Play, which is being played by boys around the world. There's a rise in rape simulator games where the boys pretend to rape women and girls. This is a game out of Japan. The aim of this game is to rape a mother and her two daughters, aged eight and ten. One is carrying a teddy bear. These ga games come with a multiple player function, so the boys can participate in the gang rape scenes together. A little bit of male bonding there over the gang rape scenes. I made a complaint about this to our, broadca to our broadcasting authority in Australia, and after my one complaint, I want you to just think about this one complaint, you can't play this game in Australia anymore. Imagine if I hadn't complained. Imagine what happens when we don't complain. These things are allowed. So I want, I want this actually to be an empowering message. You may be feeling like you need therapy about now, but really I want you to realise the strength and the power that your voice can have. So this game can't be played in Australia anymore, but it's been played in many other parts of the world. Here we have uh, some images from computer games that our boys are playing, video games, again suggesting that women want to be treated violently. And this is an extraordinary example. This is from Nickelodeon, which is a very um, well-known children's global media company. They have just produced some new games for primary school aged children. Two of these games, Perry the Sneak and Naughty Classroom. In Perry the Sneak, the boy gets points for how many girls he can spy on in the shower. That's how he advances in the game. Thank you, Nickelodeon, for that. Naughty Classroom, the wording of this game says, children, you can act out your sexual fantasies for your teacher. Putting teachers in danger. Nickelodeon, so in America, the campaign for commercial free childhood has uh, got a boycott going of Nickelodeon. They're only just two of the examples. So the American Psychological Association says, the sexualization of girls may not only reflect sexist attitudes, the societal tolerance of violence and the exploitation of girls and women, but may also contribute to these phenomena. Pressing social problems that disproportionately affect girls directly and indirectly, including violence, exploitation, pornography and prostitution may be maintained or even increased if we allow this escalating sexualization of girls. This is why this issue is so serious. The sexualization of girls and women contributes to broader societal consequences such as sexism, sex bias and sexist attitudes. This is a really good quote from a book called The Lolita Effect. 
Dressed up in the clothing made cute and innocuous by brats, pussycat dolls and junior styles bedecked with sleazy slogans, child sex workers are living embodiments of Lolita. They take the impact of the Lolita effect to the ultimate conclusion that young girls' bodies are an appropriate element of sexual commerce. Now, a lot of people think that trafficking is something happening over there, child sex abuse is something happening over in another country, but we are contributing to it by the things that we are allowing. We are providing permission to men every day that it's okay to see little girls as sexually interesting, that little girls really actually want to be sexually used in these kind of ways. Again, these are, this is the ultimate outworking of the sexualization of girls. These are little girls that I've met in Cambodia who had been rescued from brothels. So I want to think about how the taboos that we are breaking down here contributes to the sale of little girls around the world. Two million now enslaved in the sex industry, put to work in brothels, massage parlours and strip clubs. They are used to produce pornography. These girls were used to produce pornography. You could buy the pornography made from these little girls for $1.50 US, a block away from where they were now living in this refuge. It's one of the most traumatic experiences of my life meeting these girls because um, not only what, what had been done to them, they, they just had, a couple of them had just had surgery f to repair their, their bodies from what had been done to them. Uh, the taller girl there is, is mentally deranged as a result of what was done to her. But we are fueling it, we are feeding it here by everything that I've shown you. We are all complicit in this. So don't think of trafficking as happening way over there. We are making it possible, we are facilitating it and fueling it by what we are allowing. So what can we do about this? Well, I'd love you to get a hold of my book, Getting Real. Um, I'm delighted that this is now in its third printing as of last week, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls. Getting Real brings together leading authorities in the field who all come to the same conclusion about the harmful effects of the pornification of culture. <coughs> uh, you can follow me on my website, melindatankardreese.com. Um, I'm also, I'm a bit reluctant to say this now, I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a bit of a Twitter junkie too. It's all out there now. It's all out there. How are you over 24 and a half? Just. <laughs> I had just turned 24, that's right. Um, yeah, that's my Twitter account right there. I found Twitter actually brilliant for my, my course, I must say. And I, I feel like to, for my message that I want to get out there, I need to be in these social networking spaces. And uh, I'm on Facebook as well if you want to follow me there. And I'd love you to, to sign up to Collective Shout. Now, Collective Shout only started five months ago for a world free of sexploitation, as I said, naming and shaming corporations, making them accountable, reminding them of the words corporate social responsibility, which they seem not to understand. How do we do that? We boycott them. And so when they start losing money, then they start to realise, oh, perhaps we should act responsibly. So we're seeing some great successes in Australia. We're in an election year, and so we're taking it up to our politicians. What are you going to do about this toxic culture? Why aren't you making this issue more of a priority? And uh, we'll see how, we, see how we go, but so far we're going pretty well. These are two of my favourite quotes. The standard you walk past is the standard you set. So we say this standard is okay. Um, we're not going to do anything about it. We're saying that's fine for our children, our children's children, our nieces, our nephews and our friends' children. I love this quote by Lily Tomlin, the actress. She says, I always thought someone should do something about that. Don't we always say that? I wish someone would do something about that. And then she realised I was someone. I can do something about it. If all the good people of the world rised up en masse against this, we could really get somewhere. That's why I said we're complicit, because we haven't done enough about it. And it is only getting worse. I love this. This is from... What's the, this is from something called the Love Your Body campaign, what is the measure of a woman? And you see their mind, grace, peace, goodness, spirit, character, soul, compassion, personality, life, intelligence, etc. Why aren't these the values that we are encouraging our young women to aspire to rather than the airheaded cult of celebrity and fashion? And of course it takes courage to do this work. So I commend this message to you and I would love you now to be rewarded by watching one of the most delightful little film clips you'll ever see. It goes for about six minutes. It's called Ruby Who. Uh, it's made by a filmmaker friend of mine in Queensland whose daughter also appears on the cover of my book, Getting Real. So are we ready to roll with that, guys? Thanks very much.
Hehehehe <laughs>